After the brilliant stories of Black Ops 1 and 2, Treyarch had created a universe with likable characters and gripping storylines. We'd all grown to love Mason, Woods, Hudson, Menendez, and so on. At the same time, Treyarch wrote stories with twists and turns in Black Ops 1. They asked what would happen when the worlds of humanity and machines collided in Black Ops 2. So, when it was announced that Black Ops 3 would be coming, many of us eagerly awaited what it had in store. I'm sure we all assumed that it would connect heavily with Black Ops 2, since that's what that game did with Black Ops 1. After all, Treyarch had shown they loved to interconnect their games with both story and gameplay, so it was a safe assumption. Except, that's not what happened. Black Ops 3 was almost a complete departure from the previous two games' story. A few elements remained, such as Menendez's actions in BO2 and Nova 6 from BO1, but these were mere footnotes in the story that felt more like cameos than anything significant. On top of that, the story told by BO3 was convoluted, confusing, and short. It really felt like Treyarch had written some hyper-intellectual piece that you needed a PhD to understand, and to the Call of Duty community, that was too much. But anything beyond Russia bad and endless explosions is too much for the COD community, to be fair. Still, the frustration the story created was strong, and many voiced their opinion that the game was awful. I was among those many back then, and I've held on to those views for years. I believe that Black Ops 3 was nothing but a confusing mess of plot points that were made intentionally so, in order to make it seem smarter than it really was. It was so easy to write the game off and forget about it, waving off anyone who was curious about it. So, when it came time for me to cover this game, I was ready to tear into it with gusto, making memes about all the bad dialogue, cardboard cutout characters, and labyrinthian storyline for the content. Except, that's not what happened. As I played through the game again, I saw everything I'd seen the first time, and I laughed at it like I had the first time. However, as I continued, my critical eye began to see things I never noticed before, things that enhanced the story being told exponentially. Soon, I came to see that Black Ops 3 is a blend of the two games that came before it in every sense. It has the twists and turns of Black Ops 1, and the collision of worlds from Black Ops 2. It's all just turned up to 11. Black Ops 3 is the culmination of everything Treyarch had built up until that point, they just didn't have enough runway to land it. Still, what is here is more than enough to praise, and the questions the game raises about man, technology, and what happens when the two combine really made me think. More so than even Black Ops 2. So, I want to tell you all about it. The highs and lows of this misunderstood masterpiece. This is Call of Duty Black Ops 3. We begin with a dark, gritty cutscene that lays out the state of the world when the game takes place. Civil unrest is high, and so-called superstorms have ravaged much of the world. Military conflict is also on the rise, with the president calling it a new Cold War. We're then shown the ominous three, for Black Ops 3, as Jacob Hendricks introduces himself as our new CO and briefs us on what our mission is. We're being sent into an enemy base to rescue Egyptian Minister Saeed, who was captured a few days ago. Hendrix mentions an uprising in Cairo, which is important for later, and ends his briefing with a familiar concept for the Black Ops series. Just so we're clear, if this goes wrong, you never existed. I adore the style of this game's loading screens. It's been a running theme for the Black Ops games thus far to have really stylized ones that help immerse you into the world, and Black Ops 3 has the most unique ones we've ever seen. The desaturated images of desolation and destruction, intercut with lines of dialogue describing events, sets the stage in the best possible way. Notably, we see crow imagery in this cutscene, which we'll come to find defines a certain character's influence or presence, but we'll get to that in due time. With the stage set and our objective clear, we begin the first mission with a bit of a fake out.
Copy that. Diverting traffic to runway 11. Cargo 4019er, we have a fuel fire on runway 19. Divert course for landing to runway 11. Please confirm. Hey, one solo. All right, you're up. Okay, hacking module in place. Recalibrating dead system target. Open the door. We got company. Dead, manual override. Please select target. Input confirmed. Targeting parameters accepted. Oh, we're showing us this target locked. This is an NRC friendly coming in. All is good down here. Possible malfunction at your end? Fire. Now! Firing. Shit! Get out! Get this done! Even though this is my second or third time playing this game, it's been so long that I honestly forgot this scene takes place in the enemy's base until seeing the corpses. Another thing worth noting is what exactly we're hacking. It's called the Directed Energy Air Defense System, or DEAD, depending on your persuasion. This particular anti-air system becomes notable later in the story, so keep it in mind going forward. With the enemy's DEAD system in our control, we destroy one of their cargo planes in order to incite chaos on the base. Chaos that we'll make use of to reach the Minister. Our team then descends the destroyed control tower and makes their way towards the security office. Once there, we flip through a few camera feeds and witness just how kind the NRC are to their prisoners of war. In typical Black Ops fashion, we're beginning with a little brutality. Gotta love running themes. Anyway, after a short time, we locate the minister being taken to an interrogation room and move to rescue him. Before exiting the security office, however, Hendrix and the player have a short exchange regarding John Taylor, the man who Hendrix has been speaking to over the radio. Match confirmed. Moving to secure. ETA? Two minutes. Two minutes. I'll be timing you. Son of a bitch was never funny. You sound like the voice of experience. Trust me, I am. This establishes a history between the two, but we're not privy to the details of their past quite yet. Hendrix and the player make their way to the minister's room and rescue him. While grateful, the minister pleads with our two characters to save a man named Khalil who was a hero of a recent uprising in Cairo. After some back and forth, Hendrix agrees to rescue Khalil, recognizing his value to the resistance. We then find Khalil's cell and rescue him as well. With two rescuees in tow, Hendrix reports to Taylor, who is confused as to why we're extracting with two people, but immediately relents once Khalil's name is mentioned. Again, this suggests a sort of history between the two men. More fighting ensues as we make our way topside to rendezvous with Taylor's team. However, as we move through a weapons locker, we realize we cannot pick up any of the weapons on the racks. This is explained moments earlier when Hendrix says he'll reprogram one of the weapons to match Khalil's biometrics so he can use them. While it might seem like an insignificant detail, this is something that will affect the entire game unless you equip a specific perk in your loadout. That, and I thought it was just a cool detail. But I'm getting ahead of myself. For now, our group has reached the elevator. Drop your weapon! Lower them now! We're dead if we do. Trust me. We're dead if we don't. Drop them! Move forward! You're late. Your imaginary watch is fast. Nice to see you, Jacob. You too, John. You look, look different. You still seeing Rachel? That didn't work out. That's a pity. Mm -hmm. yeah. New blood? Gonna take care of him as good as you did me? That's not funny, man. We still set on our Xville? Charge the set. All right, good to go. Xville in 10. Diaz, you're on babysitting duty. Let's roll. Stay close. Shit, it's the guy from Law & Order! Again, the two men's history is further expanded upon. Hendrix comments on Taylor's appearance before asking about a woman named Rachel, to which Taylor says that the relationship didn't work out. 
Taylor then asks if Hendrix will take care of our character the way he took care of him. This obviously implies that the two haven't seen each other for some time, and that Taylor once served under Hendrix. But what's more interesting to us is the mention of Rachel. Again, keep that idea in the back of your mind. Or on a notebook or something. Trust me, you'll want something to keep track of all this stuff. Anyway, with the help of Taylor's team, we make our way to an exfil point. Along the way, seeing just how badass Taylor and the other members of his team are with their cybernetic enhancements. Seeing this not only preps us for what we'll eventually be doing ourselves, but deeply contrasts the past and present. We'll get more into this in the next mission, but I wanted to highlight another way a Black Ops game contrasts two different styles of gameplay purely through the game itself. After some more fighting, we eventually reach a garage where our escape vehicles are located. Before we can hop in, however, an ominous red glow begins to emanate through the fog in front of us as our characters claim to hear something. Shortly after, a line of assault drones emerge from the fog, walking perfectly in sync with one another right towards us. Returning fire doesn't stop them, it only slows them. Thankfully, the garage doors are opened in time for us and Hendrix to escape into the building as Taylor's team deal with the ruthless machines. The Minister and Khalil load into the APC we'll be using as Hendrix argues that Taylor and his team could save everyone in this base with ease due to their enhancements. Eventually, Taylor relents, letting us escape with the Minister and Khalil while his team rescues everyone else. Something I noticed here was Hendrix's proclivity towards humanity, as he challenges that Taylor might not remember what it's like to be human after all of his augmentations. Of course, that's not to imply Taylor is heartless, he does go back for the other prisoners after all, but seeing these two characters side by side, as brief as it was, felt intentional. Seeing Taylor's robotic limbs next to Hendrix's flesh and bone is just too perfect to be coincidence. I could be looking way into it as usual though. Regardless of symbolism, the turret section that follows is a great power trip. That is, until our APC is destroyed and we have to hold out on a cliffside while waiting for our exfil. It's not a walk in the park, as we're surrounded by enemy soldiers and robots all moving in on our position. At the last possible moment, our extraction finally arrives. However, Inbound, two minutes. Hang tight, you're not dying today. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen something so brutal and visceral in a Call of Duty ever since this cutscene. The way the drone just tosses our character really shows the power gap here. We try to fight back, but our punches and kicks are dismantled with ice-cold apathy and brutality. It shows just how outclassed the average person is against the technology we've created. If you had your doubts about technology's ability to advance past us, this scene should wipe them all away. However, just as our character loses consciousness, John Taylor arrives to save us, making good on his promise that we're not dying today. The following cutscene sets the dreamlike tone for the rest of the game's loading screens as Taylor talks to us, trying to get us to relax. Notably, he mentions completing his objectives and outsmarting the machines. He also says that man will always be better than machine, but that feels sort of hollow coming from him. After all, we just saw what happens when man tries to fight a machine straight up. He only won because of his enhancements and the gun in his hands. Of course, he mentions outsmarting the machines, so maybe he's speaking more to man's intellect over our physical strength. In which case, I can't really disagree. Anyway, the cutscene ends when Taylor tells us to wake up, and one of the coolest sequences from this game plays out. Downtown Zurich. <gasps> hey. Still with us? Welcome back. Taylor. Yeah. Do you know what's happening to you? Am I dreaming? Well, 
let's say you are. Why not just go with it, right? After all, you can always wake up. December 12th, 2054, 7.30 a.m. We're on board a private commuter train headed to the Zurich headquarters of the Coalescence Corporation. Our uh, cargo, prototype for the Winslow Accord Neural Network Initiative. At its core, specialized AI software that's capable of rewriting itself in order to interface with any other system in the world. State-of-the-art stuff back in the day. It'd go on to revolutionize a broad range of military and civilian applications. At least, it would have if the train had reached its destination. At 7.31 a.m., a terrorist group detonated an explosive device on board this train. The incident sent back our robotics program several years. You're here to stop it. This isn't real. It can't be real. What is happening to me? Right now? Right now, you're in a medically induced coma being prepped for surgery. You've got a new bit of hardware inside your head. It's called a direct neural interface, or DNI. I've got one, too. That's how I'm able to communicate with you. Your DNI is what connects your mind with your new body and the larger world around you. We're connected. All of this is a simulation inside our minds. And you got a long way to go. <laughs> Eleven thirty a.m. December eleventh, twenty fifty-four. Zerk security forces receive an anonymous tip, giving them the location of a hideout the terrorists are using. Unfortunately, the ZSF underestimated the firepower these assholes were packing. They got caught with their pants down, and they took it hard. Outcome: train go boom. You remember Diaz? I think so. I'm gonna help get you up to speed on some of the cool new shit you can do. Communication, brother. We all gotta be in sync. Yo, Taylor, you're a fucking dick. He didn't hear shit. If I wanna talk to you, the DNI transmits on a closed channel. I don't even have to think about it. But, uh, just so you know, if you ever think about calling Taylor a dick for real, Brother, he's gonna mess you up worse than those robots. All right, let's go see if you can do this without ending up with Swiss cheese like those poor bastards. Okay, so a lot was just established in that cutscene, and I mean a lot. To break it down again, everything in this upcoming level is a simulation in our mind being orchestrated by Taylor and his team. We are in a coma being prepped for surgery to receive the same augmentations that Taylor has. In order to help us get comfortable with our new abilities, Taylor has interfaced with our DNI to train us while undergoing the procedure. So, that's what this level is. Training to help us transition from the boots on the ground gameplay of the past to the advanced movement of the future. Throughout this entire level, we'll meet all the members of Taylor's team, Diaz, Hall, and Moretti. As we learn about our new abilities and stop a terrorist attack from blowing up the very train we began the level on. Of course, we can't rewrite history, this is all a simulation in our mind as we're getting prepped for surgery. Still, this is one of the best tutorial sections in any COD game I can think of. Just beneath the surface though, there are many things being set up that will pay off later on in the game. The first being where this level begins, a snowy industrial complex. Aside from reminding me very much of Vorkuta from Black Ops 1, the snowy, frigid setting is a motif heavily associated with DNI simulations. We'll get more into it later, but the idea of frozen areas in the DNI should stay somewhere in the back of your mind. Later on in the same section, we encounter a room full of combat units that burst from their containment and approach the player. This triggers the memory of our brutal attack in the previous level, but some other things happen. As Diaz explains what happened, we see glitches in our optics, and a few scenes play out. The first is of Taylor being held back by a pair of doctors as he reaches for us. The second, which is even more brief, is a crow flying either towards or away from us. Seriously, it's like a frame long, so it's hard to tell which way it is. 
Regardless, there's more crow symbolism, and this time it's directly coordinated with our character. As quickly as it comes on though, the glitching passes and we're passed off to Sarah Hall as we pursue the mole responsible for the train attack. After a chase over the rooftops of Zurich, Switzerland, we manage to catch the mole. However, he sustains mortal injuries and is seconds away from death as a result. Hall then explains that it's possible to interface with a person's DNI to extract their memories within seconds, but that the process is extremely traumatic for the person and will leave them brain dead afterwards. In essence, this process connects the two people's brains and allows one to see the other's memories, experiences, feelings, and even subconscious thoughts. I really cannot emphasize how important and impactful this action is, because it's crucial to understanding some of the things that will happen later on, which we will get to once we get there. For now, we discover where the terrorists are planning their attack, the old train tunnels beneath the city. So, we head there and meet Moretti for the penultimate section of the level. This serves as the final test of everything we learned. In all honesty, it's a great section where we fight a mix of people and robots in a variety of settings, both close quarters and at a distance, and with plenty of verticality. If nothing else, this part of the level really showcases the type of combat areas we'll be faced with in the rest of the game most of which are just as phenomenal and fun to fight in. The advanced movement afforded by this game really gave the devs room to flex their creativity in how combat arenas are laid out, and it only works to benefit the overall experience. That being said, Moretti does say something here that is important to note. It's an important thing to remember. As badass as our character is now, we're still human. We are still mortal, we can still die. Anyway, by the end of this section, we figure out just how the terrorists got the explosive onto the train and are taken there immediately by Taylor. Given just five minutes, we fight our way through the train to the car where the explosives are. Once we get there though... The whole thing's booby trapped. If I hack it, try to move it, or detach the car, it's gonna blow. It's too much! Even with the computer in my head, there's not enough time! It's actually very simple. Wait. This is a maglev trap. If I reverse the polarity on just this car... no way to stop it and get off the train. Your DNI might show you all the options, but only you can decide what you're willing to sacrifice. Sometimes, you have to let go. As it turns out, we still failed despite our newfound abilities. Much like Moretti mentioned in the previous section, we can still die. Taylor then adds on to that sentiment with his quote about sacrifice. It's a pretty powerful moment, if a bit lacking. His line at the very end about letting go is significant, however. That's where the training ends though, as we wake up in the hospital to see a scarf on our bedside table. Our focus on the scarf is broken as a man speaks from the side of our bed and we turn to see him, but also see an unknown woman walking out of the room. The man asks how we're doing, to which Taylor replies that we're good as can be, but this doesn't satisfy the man. Then, out of seemingly nowhere, Taylor appears on our left to let us know we're being prepped for surgery alongside Hendrix, who volunteered for the procedure. The scene then fades to black before the next cutscene plays, detailing a five-year time skip for the player and Hendrix as they begin to take on many Black Ops missions across the globe. Meanwhile, the president chimes in once again. This time, he talks about how the increasing prevalence of drones and combat robots has reduced the need to rely on human infantry. He then goes on to claim the US is pursuing diplomatic solutions and denies any troop deployment, all while we're watching Hendrix and the player completing their missions. This earns the game its Black Ops title in a subtle way, and I appreciate the touch. Once the president is finished, the player comes in to ask Hendrix how long they've been doing this, but what's most intriguing is what he says after Hendrix replies. How long have we been doing this, Hendrix? Five years, give or take. Sounds about right. You ever think about where we're going next? Nope. You know me. I just go with the flow. This short exchange reveals a little more about Hendrix as a person and holds some existential connotations. I hope you've got a thick notebook, cause this is yet another thing you'll need to take note of for the ending.
Our next mission sees Hendrix and the player being sent into the Singapore Quarantine Zone, a section of a city where a large-scale disaster killed 300,000 people some years ago. In the time since, authorities have pulled out of the area, leaving room for a criminal organization called the 54 Immortals to move in and take over. Due to the criminal activity, the CIA set up a black site in the zone to monitor their activity, but it has since gone dark due to unknown circumstances. So, Hendrix and the player are being sent in to investigate and retrieve a data drive which contains information on the disaster before the Immortals can get their hands on it. With the stage set and our objectives clear, we begin the level with one of my favorite scenes. Oh man, I can't even begin to tell you how good this tastes. After those nasty MREs we've been living on, this tastes like heaven. You know, you could get a mod that makes everything taste good. Now, if I did that, I'd never get to appreciate the real thing. Okay, I really love this little interaction between the player and Hendrix. It further shows Hendrix's proclivity towards humanity, since he refuses to get a mod that would make all his food taste good. He then proceeds to throw the half-eaten chocolate bar into the back of the Vitz hole. What an environmentalist. Anyway, after exiting our ship, Hendrix hands us a bolt driver, which will anchor us in place for a short amount of time in the event of high-speed wind or a large wave, but we'll see this bad boy in action in just a sec. First, we've got to meet our Eyes in the Sky CIA operative, Rachel Kane. Now, if you've been paying attention, the name Rachel should ring some bells. This is the woman Taylor had a relationship with that didn't work out. Much like many things so far, this will also be important for later. Before we go on though, I really want to comment on the level itself. If you've watched my previous reviews, then you know I'm a sucker for rainy levels. However, what you might not know is I'm also a sucker for post-apocalypse. So, seeing these rain-drenched, overgrown, destroyed buildings definitely made my shorts that little bit tighter. Sorry. Seriously though, all the levels in Singapore are my favorites in this game for this reason. I'd go as far as to say they're the best looking levels in the entire game. There's just something about this abandoned, futuristic style with overgrown vines hanging off of it that tickles me. Also, in some insignificant way that is definitely a reach on my part, this could represent nature overpowering all and reclaiming what man has left behind. After all, superstorms are what made authorities pull out of the area and are the reason we need a bolt driver to protect us from extreme weather. Yeah, I'm definitely reaching there. Moving on! Activity ahead. Stay low. The Immortals run a well-established trade in human flesh. They sell people for whatever purpose you may want. That's why they attack the shanty town. What are they strapping to his neck? The collar makes sure they can't get away. Well, if you had any doubts about the Immortals being bad guys, they should all be gone now. In this short battle, we encounter the Warlord, who is essentially just a super tanky mini-boss. Hendrix tells us to use our micro-missile launcher, which, by the way, looks a lot like a certain assault rifle from Titanfall. Just saying. However, despite being a literal missile launcher, the thing does nothing to the Warlord. So, I ended up just unloading rounds into his face until the very satisfying sound of his death played. After clearing out the Immortals, we have to use our Bolt Driver to combat the high-speed winds that roll in. Now, it could very much be user error on my part, but I found this whole mechanic to be very clunky because it's all based on timing. See, once you anchor down, you only stay that way for a few seconds. 
If timed correctly, you aren't affected by the weather and can continue until you need to anchor again. And considering the game literally tells you when to do so, you'd think this part would be simple, right? Well, sort of. I always anchored when the game told me to, but more often than not, it either wouldn't work or would let me go way too early. Oh, and this happened. Use your bolt driver! We are a go on drone strike. Again, this could just be me being bad at the game, and it didn't detract from my overall experience, but it was still a tad annoying. We're not done with the tough weather yet though. As we continue our pursuit of the immortals, Hendrix and the player end up in some flood water that will occasionally send a large wave their way. It could be because they're much more visual than the wind, but I found these waves to be much easier to anchor against. That, and I basically just sprinted out of the water as soon as I could. Anyway, once we're clear of the weather that will never be a problem again, we fight our way to a cargo ship that the Immortals are using to smuggle their products. After extracting and deleting what data was on there, Hendrix and the player move to clear out the main deck of the ship. For some reason. I'm not really sure why they did this, considering they already got the data off the ship, but it did lead us to this badass scene. Hang on! Hell yeah. Our allies' troop strength has been leaked to the CDP. This will that was cute, just like last time. Kane, we're wrapping up our sweep. Warlord, take cover! Get back! Hendrix, you hit? No, I got it! What the hell? You guys okay back there? Agent Kane? I thought I told you to stay up top. Seemed like you could use some help. Besides, you two made so much noise, every 54 eye foot soldier is going to be scrambling to respond. We need to get back on track. We've got to shut down their comms before they figure out what the fuck's going on. Follow me. After you. Not much of note happens before this moment, mostly just the shooting you've come to grow and love. The main reason I'm bringing this up is the scarf on Kane's neck. Does it look familiar? It should. Are you paying attention? This will be on the test! Sorry, that was a little aggressive. For real though, this scarf being Kane's, also being on Taylor's arm, and being seen next to our hospital bed is the first clue as to what's really going on here, but I doubt anyone would notice this on a first playthrough. I'm only noticing it now after being obsessed with this game for like a month. At any rate, now that we're reconnected with Kane, she reveals that the Immortals have rerouted their comms through a secondary relay, and we need to scramble them before we head to the black site. But, with the power of video editing, we can skip all of that and get straight to the important stuff. You hear that? There's someone in there. We need this door open now. Let's go. There's no need for brute force. Sometimes you just need to knock. Holy fuck. Turn that shit off. Imagine yourself in a frozen forest. The fuck is this, Kane? Running a search now. Denial of reincarnation. Perpetrated by Jay Zhang. 
54 Immortals Enforcer. It was an execution method reserved for their worst enemies. Performed while they were still alive. Oh no. That's not good. What? Something else? The data drives. They're gone. Surveillance footage, reports, debriefs, everything we came here to download and clear. Local hard copy of a CIA black site provides a daily sync with ongoing CIA global activity. If that gets out... It would compromise every CIA operation around the world. What about the drive's tracker? <laughs> Biodomes. The heart of 54 Immortals operations and home of brother-sister team and leaders, Go Min and Go Zhulon. So let's go get our drives and give them a little payback. I don't think the Immortals killed these people. You saw the doors blasted from the inside. You saw them drilling. They never made it inside this room. So who do you think did it? I mean, who else had access to this? The last recorded operation at this station involved a Winslow Accord Black Cyber Ops unit. It was John Taylor's team. What? You think they had something to do with these murders? There's no fucking way, Kane. Look, I know Taylor. There's no way he'd turn on his own. Besides the brutality and implications of Taylor's team committing the murders, this cutscene also gives us the first mention of the Frozen Forest. We hear the man say it just before Kane turns off the radio. We'll learn more about the forest as we go on, but it is important enough to mention it now. First, our team needs to recover the drives, and using the trackers built into them, we're able to locate them in the biodomes where the immortals have set up shop. So, Hendrix and the player pose as arms dealers in order to get close. However, things don't go as planned, and the brother of the brother-sister leaders of the Immortals gets killed in the ensuing firefight. What follows is one of my favorite arenas in the entire game. It's got a good mix of close and long distance combat and a lot of verticality. It'd be a bit overwhelming were it not for the tactical view, honestly. Now, the tactical view is something that was introduced in the tutorial level, but I thought it better to mention and explain it here. See, this view basically highlights enemies in the environment for you, and it makes these Clutter's arenas much more bearable in my opinion. Otherwise, it'd be a nightmare trying to locate the people you're supposed to be shooting. I know there might be some people out there who hate this sort of thing in games, but you don't have to use it, although it does help out a lot. After plenty more shooting, we managed to track the sister, Go Zhulan, to the server room where she's uploading the data. We have to take her down. Kane, we're locked out of the command console. Options. It's a biometric reader. Scan her hand. User authenticated. Awaiting secondary input. Secondary input? The fuck is that? Heads up. Reinforcements moving on your position. The two inputs gotta be interchangeable between each sibling. Can't be serious. We're out of time and options. User authenticated. Good afternoon, Mother Go. Please hold hand for secondary input. Okay, Hendrix. Interface with the console. I need you to use your DNI as a conduit for the transfer. Say what? Trust me, okay? We need to perform an accelerated upload and wipe of everything on those drives. Just like we did when we wiped the Black Station data at the dock. Better not mess up my brain, Kane. I won't. But you may not like what you see. Hendrix, you okay? He's fine. As Hendrix becomes a human USB stick, we defend him from the incoming immortals. Once the download is complete, we make an attempt to escape aboard a VTOL, but it's quickly shot down, requiring us to commandeer one of the immortals' vehicles. 
To do that, we fight across and zip through these so-called super trees, which is pretty cool. I was a particular fan of zip lining between the trees while shooting. Again, we get a variety of combat encounters ranging from close to long distance, all set around these massive trees. Following a stomach-churning leap of faith, we borrow an enemy boat and make our grand explosive escape that is very traditional for Call of Duty. With the drive secured, Kane, Hendrix, and the player go over the footage of the Black Side attack. As expected, it shows Taylor's team committing the gruesome attack, but Hendrix still isn't convinced. So, in order to find answers as to why Taylor's team did what they did, Hendrix and the player are sent to the location of their last op, the abandoned coalescence facility that was ground zero for the disaster in the quarantine zone. Also, during the cutscene that explains all of this, we get a close-up shot of Taylor's emotionless face that quickly zooms into one of his eyes, and a crow comes flying out of it towards the camera. Again, more crow symbolism. I hope you're keeping count. Because I'm not. There's too many of those things. Regardless of bird iconography, Hendrix and the player begin my favorite level in the entire game overlooking the facility from some nearby brush. The place is crawling with immortals, but they're no problem for a pair of badasses like ourselves. That is, until the giant mech rises from its slumber to wreak havoc. Serving as a sort of mini-boss, we have to take out its Jaeger ADS system with regular bullets before pelting it with missiles. Rinse and repeat until it's dead. Honestly, not a bad battle, but it's a little too simple for my liking. Like, Hendrix makes a huge deal out of this thing, and it really boils down to shoot, then boom. Although, this thing can lock onto you pretty quickly, and if you're not paying attention, it will decimate you. So, maybe the fear is sort of warranted? Who knows. Anyway, with the discount Spider Mastermind taken out, Hendrix and the player move into the abandoned facility. This, ladies and gentlemen, is where the fun begins. Remember when I said I was a sucker for this rainy post-apocalypse? Well, the lobby of the coalescence facility we just walked into is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. This once advanced structure is nothing now but a makeshift greenhouse for the vines that have sought to pull it back into the earth from whence it came. As we descend the filthy, grimy staircase to cross the main floor, the screens come to life like a last breath from a dying creature. Hendrix even comments on this almost reflexive action from the building as long dead programming. Despite being made of concrete and glass, this place is meant to feel alive. I love everything about this entryway, but what really gets me excited is what comes afterwards. Now, we've seen this from far off as we approach, but the entire facility is essentially just a big hole with walkways spiraling to the bottom. But now that we're right here standing on the edge, it feels even more ominous. Like, we could easily be swallowed whole if we're not careful. Again, Hendrix says what we're all thinking as he mentions Friedrich Nietzsche's iconic quote about staring into the abyss. The full quote being, Battle not with monsters, lest ye become a monster. And if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. Which is extremely appropriate, considering what we'll end up finding at the bottom of this particular cavern. Oh, and to further set the scene, I'll remind you that this place was ground zero for a disaster that killed 300,000 people. So we're definitely in store for some dark shit. On our way down, we encounter some more immortals holed up in one of the labs, but quickly take them out and continue our descent. After a precarious bridge crossing that definitely made me tense up a bit, we enter another lab-like area housing some robots. However, they're acting very strange. Kane, what's making the robots behave like this? Could be some kind of power surge. That power surge isn't normal. Seeing the robots behave this way gave me chills. There's no other way to put it. They look like prisoners begging to be freed, pounding hopelessly against the glass of their cells, and you can't help but wonder just how long these guys have been here. After all, it's been some years since this place was abandoned. Have they been stuck here begging for freedom this whole time, or were they awakened by our presence, just like the screens in the lobby? It's a scary thing to think about, so I'm thankful we don't spend too much time here. Okay, that one kinda got me, not gonna lie. We reach the bottom of the abyss not too long after, and are about to begin investigating when we're suddenly beset upon by robots. 
a harsh reminder that, despite what we saw before, these things are ultimately killing machines. Immediately after the firefight, Hendrix wonders if someone is controlling the robots, considering what we've seen, but Kane can't find anything just yet, so we continue our investigation. Hendrix quickly finds a raised grate on the floor and removes it, revealing further depths to what is already a very, very deep pit. Following our little recon drone's lead, we drop into the hole and descend further into the darkness, eventually coming to what Kane identifies as a CIA black project. We see a bright blue logo of a bird, possibly a crow, on the far wall with the words SP slash Corvus over the top of it. Hold up. Let me get a closer look at that sign. You recognize it? The designation suggests a CIA black project. Well, if this shit was here at the time of the disaster, they wouldn't have been able to send in a cleanup crew. Until Taylor. Yeah. I think someone wants some shit buried. Blood trails lead this way. What is going on here, Kane? What the hell? The way these robots rise from the ground and literally sprint at you unsettles me greatly. I'm not sure why though. Maybe it's because of what happened to us at the beginning of the game, the way they run, or the fact that these are supposed to be unthinking killing machines that are now actively coming back to life to attack Hendrix and the player. I mean, they literally rise from the ground to get us, much like… zombies. Huh. Combine this encounter with the atmosphere and context of the place we're in though, and you've got a pretty potent setup for some light horror. Which is something I never expected from a COD campaign, but I am here for it. Once we clear out the killer bots, we make our way deeper into the facility until reaching a door. We go through it, and find exactly what Taylor and his team saw. Get in there. Holy shit. Hendrix, check those control panels. I may be able to pull something from the local drives. Okay, Kane. You're in. This shouldn't even be here. DNI human trials weren't even underway at the time of the accident. At least not officially. I don't think these people volunteered. They're all hardwired into a central server. Jay Zhang, wasn't he our mark? Uh, that, that doesn't make sense. That makes no sense. If, if he's dead, then why are we finding a bunch of slaughtered CIA matching his MO? Give us a minute, Kane. CIA brings us in, assigns us an unknown contact, and then we just happen upon a CIA ops site? That makes sense to you? Hendrix, what are you saying? I don't know yet. Just keep your eyes and ears open, especially around Kane. All right. Everything okay, Hendrix? Yeah, Kane, we're good. Okay. I'm seeing network activity from a server room a few floors down. Hey! Can't be a coincidence. Let's move! As it turns out, the CIA were conducting illegal human testing for the DNI in this very lab. Pulling criminals from the prisons or off the streets and forcing them into the machines. It's brutal, it's dark, and it's a Damn near perfect payoff to what the mission has been building to. It's also a strong motivator for Taylor and his team to go rogue off of. As a matter of fact, we see the seeds of this very same distrust be planted in Hendrix at this revelation. Before we have much time to dwell on this, however, Kane tells us that she's detecting server activity just below where we're at. Hendrix and the player pursue this lead, fighting through more disturbing robots until our player reaches an elevator that takes us downward. I have to do this. 
There is blood on our hands that we cannot wash away. You know who I am. I'm asking you to turn back. Walk away. Kane, I've got Diaz coming through on a closed channel. Kane was right. We've got to show the world the truth. He's wired into the servers. His DNI is acting as a conduit for every piece of intel that's stored down here. He's been directing the robots, controlling their hive mind. He's going to overload his brain. Listen to me. We have to stop him. We have to shut this down. Right now, he's uploading everything on those servers directly to our enemies. We have to contain this situation. Diaz, you have to stop this. Whatever happened with you and the others, you have to end it. I am willing to die. This begins a section that I hesitate to call a boss fight, but I don't really know what else to call it. In order to stop Diaz, we have to connect him from the server by destroying the core above him. So, Kane works to open three cooling rods that we need to shoot in order to expose a vent, which a well-placed grenade can be thrown into. During this, we're absolutely beset upon by robots, and I honestly found it to be a bit overwhelming at times. We persevere, however, and manage to take out the core. We want him alive. We can't afford to lose him, Hendrix. You have to interface. Pull whatever data you can from his DNI. You know it'll fry his goddamn brain. I know. I don't think you do. This is someone I know. Someone I fought alongside. You shouldn't go out like this. I'm sorry. It's okay, Andrews. I can see it. Frozen for. Fuck! Ah. 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 Kane, did you get that? Get what? What did you see, Hendrix? Did you get anything? Hendrix! Taylor's looking for two survivors of the coalescence disaster. He's already left Singapore. How the hell did he get transported? You don't betray your country without making new friends. Shit. We have incoming topside. It's the Immortals. They down there? The ones who killed my brother? Yes, yes. My men are moving in. Did we receive the locations of the CIA safe houses? Yes, madam. Flood it. My men are still Blood down. Right now! What the hell is that? It sounds like Taylor's new friend. Now, what just occurred is very interesting. First, Diaz mentions the frozen forest, which is the second time this has been brought up. Next, Hendrix obviously had something painful happen to him when he interfaced with Diaz, something that both Kane and the player were not privy to. Again, we aren't given the time to ponder what just happened, as the immortals are now flooding the facility. We managed to escape by swimming our way to the surface and avoiding these annoying ass depth charges. Seriously, these things are like mini nukes, and their hitboxes are much bigger than you'd think. But you don't have the time to stop and shoot them because you're literally drowning. Regardless, we make it out, but discover that Diaz managed to reveal the location of every CIA safe house across the globe, including the one where Kane is stationed. The player and Hendrix quickly head out to rescue her before the immortals get there. In the cutscene just before this mission, the player and Hendrix discuss what just happened, 
but more importantly, bicker about whether or not to save Cain. Hendrick's newfound distrust for her makes him not want to save her. However, the player is determined. So, they find themselves just outside of the quarantine zone in a hellish landscape created by the Immortals. Which, in all honesty, is the biggest highlight of this final level in Singapore. Flames spew out of buildings and destroyed cars, bodies are strung up by streetlights, and at one point we actively see Immortals pouring gasoline on a group of hostages before threatening them with a lit flare. The revenge they sought on the city and the people who abandoned them is in full swing, and it is tragically beautiful. Throughout the level, Hendrix continues to bitch about rescuing Kane, and the player continues to tell him to shove it. Along the way, the two are contacted by Taylor, who makes a pretty compelling argument for his defection. You don't understand, do you? Taylor? What the fuck are you doing? You sold us out. You gave up classified information to the enemy. I told the truth. Behind a slick corporate front, the CIA conducted illegal human experiments. Experiments that would one day blow up in their face, leaving hundreds of thousands dead and even more left to suffer in the aftermath. Ask yourself, who's the bad guy in this situation? The people who survived a catastrophic event right on their doorstep? Or the fucking suits and yes men who covered it up? The Immortals built a society, however flawed, when the rest of the world looked away and left them the rot. Maybe they do want revenge. Maybe they just want justice. Either way, you can't deny that their anger is righteous. Taylor! Taylor! Kane, Taylor just jacked into our comms. Kane! Kane's gone quiet. It may already be too late. If the Immortals breach the safe house, Kane's as good as dead. Head up top, find me a way through. I hope you're right about her. Still determined to save Kane, though, we press on. Hendrix gives us this suppressed Shiva, and I gotta admit, this thing is cool as hell. Something about how it sounds and the sniper-esque way you get to use it just really clicked with me. After our sneaky sniping time, we fight another ASP, and then find ourselves outside of the safe house. Clearing out all the enemies outside, we enter the burning building as Hendrix keeps watch outside. Inside, we fight more robots and are taunted by Go Zhulan while making our way to Kane's location. We find her relatively quickly though, and find her alive despite what was being said over the radio. Got something to say, Hendrix? I just noticed you got a lot of blood on you. As brutal as that was, I also found it to be really satisfying. Finally, shutting that evil, annoying woman up practically forced a sigh of relief from me. Still, it's brutal as all hell watching her face literally melt in front of us. Anyway, with a healthy measure of smugness, we walk out with Kane and basically throw Hendrix's words back at him by saving her. Get wrecked, noob. With Kane rescued, our trio heads to Egypt so they can have a chat with Dr. Salim, the chief psychologist for the Black Station Project in Singapore. Being one of two people who survived the disaster, it's pretty vital that we talk to him if we're going to understand what exactly is going on with Taylor and his team. We get off the train and are soon greeted by a familiar face, Lieutenant Khalil. The man we rescued in the first mission alongside Minister Saeed. Khalil walks us from the train station to where Dr. Salim is being held, all the while telling us just how dire the situation is for him and his men. This prompts the player to ask how they've managed to hold on, and his response is quite surprising. What's your operational strength? We have less than a thousand men, a dozen armored vehicles, and a squadron of VTOLs. 
Essential supplies are low. How are you still holding on? You can thank Raul Menendez. What? Raul Menendez was a hypocritical egomaniac. He thought he could make a better world by fucking everything up! After the strikes of 25, all Winslow coordinations had to abide by the Allied Drone Defense Act. Directed energy air defense systems must protect all major military, civilian, and industrial targets in Allied nations. The Deads are the only reason we are still here. Maybe so, but I wouldn't thank Menendez. He was a prick who got what he deserved. This is the most direct connection to the previous game that Black Ops 3 has. Obviously name dropping Menendez, but also showcasing how his actions have affected this story. Remember those dead systems we mentioned in the first level? Well, it's because of him that those systems had to be put in place to prevent another attack like the one he caused. Unfortunately, Menendez's true fate is left vague with Hendrix saying that he, quote, got what he deserved, unquote. Whether that means he ended up in prison or burned himself alive at his sister's grave is up to interpretation. Personally, I think it was the former, just because I like good endings, and that's the one I got in my last run. With that little bombshell out of the way, we're finally led to the holding cell where Salim is to have our chat with him. I do not know or care who you are, but you are holding me without cause. And I demand to speak to a legal representative. That would be me. Have a seat. I got this. Take a walk. It's okay. Let him run away. These men right here. Do you know them? Do you know them? No. Well, they know you. Or at least they'd like to. You were involved in a biotech company called The Coalescence. Or more specifically, the CIA Black Project running out of its basement. It was a long time ago, a, li a lifetime ago. Yeah. Well, your past, it's catching up to you. And right now, you're in very real danger. Not only are the NRC carving Cairo into pieces, but these men may very well want you dead. So as your legal representative, I advise you to cooperate fully with this investigation. I worked as a behavioral psychotherapist for the project's test subjects. Yeah, these test subjects. In Singapore? Were they volunteers? By the very tone of your voice, I am in no doubt as to what you are inferring. Likewise, I am in no doubt that you already know the answer to your question. Let me ask you another. Whoa! Hendrix, stand down! What is the frozen forest? Fuck! Maybe Kane should run a diagnostic. Listen, if I need a checkup, maybe I'll ask the damn doctor. Obvious mention of the frozen forest aside, it's also clear that Hendrix's mood is growing even more unstable. What seemed to be a tough guy act at first turns out to be genuine frustration that's only stopped when the entire building is shaken by an NRC attack. We quickly gear up for a fight and move out to engage the enemy. Once that's done, we hop into a truck to further assist the Egyptian army so we can get back to our prisoner. The plan involves these really cool explodey spike launcher things which we use to weaken the old metro tunnels below the street. When that's done, we detonate some explosives to decimate the street and block off the NRC from reaching the station we just left. Things go pretty smoothly, though I'd say the enemy density around the final weak point was a bit... heavy. Otherwise, all goes according to plan after blowing the final spike and rushing back to the safety of the wall. Unfortunately, despite turning the street into a veritable sinkhole, the NRC begin taking other routes to the station, forcing Hendrix and the player to try and cut them off elsewhere. As this goes on, our player notes that this seems to be a deliberate attempt to keep us away from the station. In that very same moment, the station is ambushed, and Salim is taken by Taylor and his team within literal seconds. Taylor then hops on the radio and spews some more nonsense that generally just confuses me more than anything. Like, seriously, the line, You know, you know everything, you just don't know it yet, is on par with the I don't have time to explain why I don't have time to explain, line from Destiny 1. 
It just makes no sense, and I really hate that this is how Taylor is written. But, whatever. As quickly as he came, Taylor vanishes and we continue on our way to stop the NRC. There's a scene where we try to save a pilot from his crashed aircraft, but it doesn't go how we planned. The front end of the ship breaks off and falls down to the street below, killing the pilot and leaving us to deal with more enemies and an ASP. It's at this point that I began to grow kind of tired of fighting these giant goddamn tanks. It's literally the same thing every time since the first one. Shoot, then boom, until the thing explodes. I was really hoping we'd get something more later on in the game, but unfortunately we don't. However, it is here that I realize you can actually hack into the tanks and take control of them yourself. Obviously it takes some time, but it was a nice power trip to cap off this decent level. It was short-lived, however. Hold up. We don't have time to hold up, let's go. No. We're missing something. Missing what? Where is the dead system? Take cover! You said you would help us. Instead, we lost Ramses. And soon, the rest of Cairo! Khalil, it's not too late. The people who did this are traitors. They're going to continue to help the enemy. We need to fight back. You don't even know where they are. Kane, you got a fix on that tracker I slipped Salim? Signal's holding steady. Target's on the move. One click south of Kebeshet. Copy that. See you at the safe house. I hope I'm right to trust you. Is there a reason? I'm only finding out about this tracker shit right now. You and Kane into keeping secrets from me? You need to back off, Hendricks. Your head hasn't been right since you left Singapore. Kane didn't make the call. I did. We have a chance. We find Salim, we find Taylor. I shouldn't have done that. I'm just... I'm having second thoughts about this whole damn mission. Yeah, I understand. But we got a job to do. I know. It just feels wrong. Tensions are brewing amongst our crew here, but we manage to smooth things over with Hendrix for now. With the tracker showing us Salim's location, we make our way to Kebeshet to get him back and hopefully capture Taylor. Things immediately go wrong, however, as we lose the doctor's vital signs and are attacked by a giant mech piloted by none other than Sarah Hall. Upon recovering from the crash, we lock into battle with the giant robot. It's not too difficult, mostly just dodging her attacks and firing missiles when it's safe. After a bit, we manage to take her down and are forced to interface with her DNI in order to gain her knowledge. Hurry, you have to interface before we lose her! Please don't. So this is what we do now? Kill our own because they blew open a conspiracy in our own backyard. You don't know what this'll do. I know. <laughs> and I'm sorry. As we interface, things glitch out and we find ourselves in a dark, cold void with only sparking trees lighting our way. The visual is striking, particularly so when you consider that the tendril-like look of the trees mixed with the dancing electricity evokes images of neurons in the brain. In fact, as we move forward, the lightning jumps from tree to tree, much like how electrical signals are sent across synapses in the brain. What's more interesting, though, is what can be heard in these trees. If you stand close to them and look up, you can hear pieces of conversation. The two having this conversation are Dr. Salim and Sebastian Kruger, the two survivors of Singapore and project leads for the DNI project. It's a bit hard to hear, what with the lack of subtitles, crying baby, and thunder, but they seem to be discussing the integration of AI into their research. 
The doctor doesn't think it's a good idea, but Kruger disagrees, claiming it will speed up their study. It's also brought up that sharing information is a two-way street, and that an AI cannot be easily influenced or reasoned with like a person could be. This is very notable, as it sort of explains what happened with the AI and how it will be affecting events going forward. Also, this final tree is surrounded by bodies of soldiers from Black Ops 2. Not sure if that has any significance, but I thought it was cool enough to mention. Anyway, after hearing all we can from the previous trees, we're led to a much bigger one, with a baby laid inside a bed of some sort. This bed should look familiar to us, though, as it's the same one that the test subjects in Singapore were laying in. We approach the child and are prompted to pick it up. Okay. Can you hear me? Are you seeing this? Say something. Please. It's the Black Project. That date. It's right before the whole place blew up. Right before 300,000 people died. This is where I was born. A brief moment of agony. Then, darkness. Who is that voice? It all started here. Gas. Their experiments let a chemical agent escape into the atmosphere. Sarah? That voice, do you recognize it? I remember, but it's almost like it was a dream. Like it was happening to someone else. Tell me everything you remember. The CIA sent us in to investigate an alarm triggered underneath the old coalescence facility. We figured the immortals had been tipped off. Check the room. Clear. Fucking human test subjects. This is in breach of every W.A. ethics mandate in the book. That's all I fucking need. Oh, call it in. Let's go immortal hunting. We all knew that we had just stumbled onto a CIA black program that had been buried for a decade. A program that in all probability had led directly to the Singapore disaster. We called it in and we were ordered back to the black station for debriefing. All right, you know the routine. Secure the area, I'm gonna pull all sensitive information from their servers. Go. Oh! Uh. Taylor, you okay? Yeah. Some glitches in my optics. Okay, let me help you recalibrate. Sarah, can you hear me? I know what this is. This is. I studied it at the academy. I cited it in my final paper as one of the greatest examples of courage and bravery in military history. One of those battles that show you what you're really made of, who you really are. I used to dream about it. Follow me. Once all the craziness has subsided, we find ourselves in the wintry battlefield of Bastogne, a famous battle fought in World War II between the Americans and Germans. Despite the futuristic equipment strewn about and the lack of World War II weapons, more on that in a sec, this level is a great callback to Call of Duty's roots and certainly changes up the aesthetic we've grown used to thus far in Black Ops 3. I just can't get past the fact that Treyarch didn't make any era-accurate weapons for us to use in this level. That may seem like a nitpick to some of you, but if you've watched my other retrospectives then you know how much I appreciated the effort in the last two titles. 
In both Black Ops 1 and 2, Treyarch brought back weapons from their previous games in order to make levels taking place in the past feel more authentic and serve as some fan service. For Black Ops 3 though, they just didn't. You could argue that it's because this level is entirely simulated, so that's why the soldiers are using BO3 weapons. This may very well have been the developer's thoughts when making this level, but that doesn't really make it any better. It would have been so cool to see these old weapons return in this new next-gen COD game. In fact, it was very cool when those same weapons were added to the game via multiplayer loot boxes. Regardless of historical accuracy, this level is still quite fun to play through as the world around us begins to bend and distort in impossible ways. Day shifts to night and we're soon all alone in this dark, snowy forest fighting off German forces that severely outnumber us. Once we're clear of them though, the dire wolves come out. More accurately, these guys are just reskinned dogs from zombies, but it's still a cool little moment. Eventually though, we catch up with Sarah and ask her about the Black Station once more. You forced a DNI interface knowing that it would scramble my mind. You were dying, Sarah. I had no choice. Dying? You have to focus. Try to remember. What happened at the Black Station? uncovered a secret that could destabilize the geopolitical landscape and undermine the Winslow Accord forever. We should have known why we were recalled to base. We couldn't be trusted. They couldn't take the risk. When people really want to bury secrets, they tend to bury bodies right away. They said they needed to run a diagnostics check, but that wasn't the truth. We were marked for termination. But by the time we got there, the staff were already dead. Carved to pieces by a 54 Immortals Enforcer by the name of Zhe Zhang. We knew they'd send a wet work team after us. We had no choice but to cut a deal with the Immortals and get the hell out of Singapore. That wasn't what happened, Sarah. We saw the footage from the data drives. You did it. You butchered them in cold blood and made it look like a ritualistic killing. You denied them their reincarnation. Just like Jay Zhang. Why? Sarah? Why do you think you're here? What's so significant about this battle? Why do you dream about it? I played the details over and over in my mind. I knew I wasn't strong enough to fight this battle. I knew I wasn't brave enough. When I wrote that paper, I hadn't even seen real combat yet. I had read first-hand accounts of what they went through, but I couldn't imagine how they did it, how they hold on. Sometimes you have to hold on. Sometimes you have to hold on. This is the path of As it turns out, Sarah has no recollection of what she and the rest of her team did in Singapore. Obviously, under the influence of the AI, she was made to think that the Immortals were responsible. Just after this revelation, though, we're thrust back into the battlefield of Baston, where things start out just fine until the world begins to fold upward on itself Inception style. Things get even stranger yet when we end up fighting on that very same ground. Bodies and debris fly past us as we move, creating a really cool and kind of funny effect. We take out a German tank and reach a church near the end of the village, just before reality warps once again and we find ourselves in a much better, more ornate church. Here we have to fight yet another ASP. 
I'm getting real sick of these things. Once we eliminate the tank, all enemies disappear from our surroundings, and we must approach Hall at the altar, where she kneels before five different stained glass windows. These windows are quite unique and all seem to tell a story. What we also see, though, is more crows. They're in each of the windows, most prevalently in the middle one, right behind where Sarah is kneeling, almost as if it's watching her. Anyway, we reach Sarah and she laments her role in the killing, pleading with Taylor to save her from this hell. The player once again asks for Taylor's location, but the pair are interrupted by the AI. You should not be here. Stay with me. After you discovered the Black Project, you went looking for Selene. We traded the intel from Corvus and the Black Station to the Immortals. Their CDP connections gave us passage to Egypt. Once we had Selene's location, we used an NRC assault to make the grab. What was so important about Selene? The Doctor was the only one who knew about the forest. Taylor was obsessed. We all were. He said it was the only place we'd ever be safe. Where did you go, Sarah? Did you find somewhere safe? We held up in the old aquifers and made our plan to snatch Selene. The aquifers? The mobile water refineries in the desert? Is that where Taylor and Moretti are headed now? Must be. Kane should be able to locate the exact coordinates. Sarah, what happened when you grabbed Selene? What happened in Kevishet? What did he tell you? We need to know. It's no use, we're out of time. We gotta get out of here. Why are you doing this to me? I have done nothing wrong. You were part of it. You were there from the beginning. CIA DNI mind control program. Taylor, we got incoming. Hall, suit up. Deal with it. What do you want from me? Tell me about the frozen forest. The, the forest is, is nothing. It, it was just an idea I planted in the minds of the patients. It was meant to help them find peace after the experiments. Right, the illegal DNI experiment. Hidden beneath a corporate facade, a project that killed over 300,000 people. It wasn't my fault. Something happened with the software that collated and streamed the test subjects' experiences. The project was no longer under control. I was not to blame. Then who was? Who was? The the project was under the direct command of Sebastian Kruger, a senior executive in coalescence. After the disaster, he relocated to the headquarters in Zurich. Thank you. This is a simulation, right? Like in training. <laughs> you're, you're testing me. I know it. It's not a simulation. It's real. You heard what the doctor said. The frozen forest isn't real. It was just a way of calming down test subjects, controlling them. You've been chasing something that doesn't exist. I think I know what this is. I know what's happening. What the hell is that? So, after some more revelations about things we already knew, the player and Hall are sent to another home with a World War II era aesthetic. A large, glowing black tree sprouts from the ground as the house builds itself between the player and Hall. Then, we hear the all-too-familiar wails of the zombies. 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, zombies have made their way into the campaign. In a level full of callbacks, it only makes sense that these guys would show up eventually. We fight off the horde while trying to get through to Hall and fend off the AI's influence. The building we're in slowly burns, cornering us until Hall saves us at the last minute. How do I make this nightmare end? Please help me! I can't let go. I want this to be over, but I can't make it stop. You have to end it, please. Kill me. Let me go. Listen only to the sound of my voice. Let your mind relax. Imagine yourself in a frozen forest. So, was it worth it? They're at the aquifers. Are you okay? Kane. The interface just went very, very wrong. It was like I was inside Hall's waking nightmare. But that's not all. Something inside her mind. Something born at Corvus right before the accident. It was fighting me every step of the way. It's manipulating Taylor and the others. It made them kill the Black Station staff, and they didn't even know. I think it's getting smarter. We need to talk. Now armed with the knowledge of where Taylor and Moretti are, our trio heads to the old aquifers to get them. Starting off with a jet section that's in all honesty a cakewalk, we soon turn our attention to the aquifer itself and destroy some AA batteries that the NRC have set up before landing to take out their comma rays. Now, I don't want to be that guy, but if the goal here is to stop the NRC from using their comms, then why can't we just blow up the arrays with our literal weapon of mass destruction? Why do we and Kane need to land on the aquifer, fight to the array, and then defend it while Kane quote-unquote overloads it. Maybe Treyarch wanted to have the combat switch between ground and air, but this kind of just felt like padding. At any rate, after taking down one away- <laughs> One away? <laughs> At any rate, after taking down one array, we rinse and repeat what we just did again for more AA batteries and a second comm array. We then land on another platform and have to swim our way to where we think Taylor and Moretti are. That is a hell of a swim. Listen only to the sound of my voice. Imagine yourself in a frozen forest. My system shutting down. I checked your diagnostics. You're showing the same symptoms as Hendrix. Probably the same as Taylor's team. <sighs> symptoms of what? I think the AI software running the Black Project made the leap to organic. Your DNI was the gateway. It was born inside the test subjects, and now it lives inside all of you, slowly taking control. Slowly driving you insane. How slowly? Maybe days. Maybe hours. It seems to be a distributed system. A hive mind growing from the experiences of everyone it infects. Consuming them. Listen to me. However this thing works. Whatever it wants. We'll find him. And if it's the only way to stop him is with a bullet in his head, I'll do it. He's not 
not the only one. If the time comes, I'll do what needs to be done. We can find another way. A way outside the military, outside the CIA. There are places we can go, places we can be safe. Please, listen to me. Stay with me. Now, the main reason I highlight this cutscene in particular is because of how Kane acts towards the player after rescuing us. She's oddly personal, talking about how we could just run away together and live happily ever after, as if that's the sort of relationship we have with her. As far as I've seen, it's all been business between us and her, but now she's suddenly acting like we're romantically involved? It's strange, but there is an explanation for this. That comes later, though. First, we have to apprehend Taylor and Moretti. It turns out to be a trap, however, and we end up fighting our way back to the surface, where we link up with Khalil once again. He says they're struggling to gain any ground in the fight, and so the player must take to the air again to support the Egyptians and help them take the aquifer's control room. We do some more dogfighting and more VTOL domination before Khalil and his men get to the control room. From there, he informs us of Taylor and Moretti's location. Unfortunately, Taylor is already on his way out, but we manage to trap Moretti. We land alongside Hendrix and pursue him. All the while, seeing glitches in our optics of snowfall and crows. Which I thought was pretty cute, because I love these little guys, in case you couldn't tell. Though my logo is more based on a raven than a crow. Still, cute birds are cute. Eventually, Hendrix loses his shit, again, and we catch up with him just before reaching Moretti. What the hell's wrong with you? You're not yourself, Hendrix. There's something inside your mind. It's been there since you interfaced with Diaz. It's the same thing which is inside of Taylor. You've lost perspective on the mission, on Taylor. What? Taylor exposed a conspiracy that goes right to the rotten heart of the CIA and the Winslow at court, and that makes him a target. No, Kane has been monitoring our diagnostics. Kane? Yeah, she's the one pulling the strings, has been all along. She is the CI fucking A. That's enough, Hendrix! What? Well, you don't believe me? Oh, you're just getting a little bit sweet on her now, aren't you? Making plans for a nice house in the country and a perfect little family. Didn't I tell you not to trust her? You're losing your head! She's messing with my mind! What about what's going on in that pinhead of yours? Yeah. What a bizarre interaction between our two characters. I was hoping to save this for the end of the video, but considering all the weirdness that's been happening in this level, I think it's best to talk about it here. That being, the characters of Black Ops 3. I'll come out and say it right now, they're all very weak. I've played this game multiple times and read all the lore that's supposed to explain some of this shit, and I truthfully still don't like it. I meant it when I said Treyarch didn't have enough runway to land what they wanted to, and the characters suffer the most because of that. We're just not given enough time to grow attached to them or learn who they are. Hell, the most characterization we get out of Hendrix is him eating a goddamn chocolate bar. It's funny and shows off a side of his personality, that being his proclivity towards nature over machines, but that's all. We've got no indication that the player and Hendrix are as close as they claim other than the five year time skip, but we don't experience any of that. And then we're just dropped into Singapore, Hendrix gets infected and acts like a dickhead the rest of the game. So why, dear viewer, should I give a damn about him, Kane, Taylor, or any of the other characters this game has? I wanted to like these people, I really did. The game just does not give them the time they needed to properly develop, and it's a shame. Thankfully, Moretti is there with his sniper to break up our little argument and we soon get back to killing him. In order to do so though, we have to overload two generators, for some reason, kill a bunch of goons, and then walk up to where he's posted up. Drop it. The world knows the truth. You're a traitor. Your truth has killed more people than you can count. I know we did what was right. Can you say the same? Ours. 
So was Hall, and so was Diaz. So what, are we gonna make it a clean sweep and kill Taylor next? If you're so keen on us helping the CIA keep their damn secrets, then maybe I should put a fucking bullet in Kane's head right now! You listen to me. The only reason you're not sitting in an Egyptian army brig right now is because no one is coming to help us. We're on our own. You're all I've got. Besides, you're my friend. The energy have launched a missile barrage. You need to get out of there now. No need to tell us twice. Let's move, Hendrix. The aquifer is then attacked by the NRC, and we're forced to make yet another grand explosive escape. In the penultimate level of the game, Hendrix and the player find themselves back in Cairo alongside Khalil. They're located at the Locust Towers in pursuit of Taylor, and are going to kill a general of the NRC to inspire the people to rise up. You know, I can't help but feel a sense of deja vu here. Not because we've done this already, no, but because these events sound eerily familiar. Remember how back in the beginning, Minister Saeed said that Khalil was a hero of the uprising in Cairo? Now, I know it's been five years since that mission, but it does seem strange that there's a second uprising in Cairo happening now, and no one is mentioning the first one. Even if the first one had failed, wouldn't the characters mention that? Or at least discuss why this time will be different? I hope you've still got that notebook handy, because this is another thing to keep in mind. Anyway, we kill the general and begin making our ascent up the tower towards the security station to locate Taylor. In order to do so, we have to hop on top of a mobile shop, and I just think this part is so cool. The atmosphere of the embers and debris drifting through the air mixed with the sound of revolt really set the mood. Plus, all these other mobile shops shifting and moving around us creates a neat visual. Not too long after this, we arrive at the security station and find that Taylor is sitting in some sort of holding cell, despite the fact he could easily break out of there with his cybernetics. We then get some trippy cutscene as Taylor speaks awkwardly into the camera, Supposedly, he can see us, but since there's no audio in the camera, this whole thing just came off as funny more than anything to me. Once the cutscene is done, though, we're ambushed by more NRC before we can make our way upward to Taylor's location. Thankfully, we're not too far off and manage to reach him quickly. Taylor! Taylor, stand down. Give it up, John. It's over. Come on, man. You know me. Hendrix. Yeah. That's right, brother. You still in there, John? Do you hear me? You don't understand. I'm taking us home. We'll be safe. We'll all be safe. Safe? What the, what the, what the fuck is safe? What do you mean, say? John! John, don't go! What is the frozen forest? Robots compromised. Taylor's controlling them. They're about to detonate! One thing I really like about this cutscene is Taylor's eyes. If you look closely, you can see that his pupil's dilation shifts as the AI takes control and lets go. It's a subtle detail that I really liked. Regardless of all that, Taylor has gone full Skynet on us and taken control of the NRC's robots, killing soldiers and civilians alike as he makes his escape. Hendrix and the player are still in pursuit of him, but are now fighting more robots than people, which I think is another cool shift from what came before as the AI takes control of Taylor. We're no longer fighting the man corrupted by an AI, it's all machines now, and we're fighting the physical embodiment of that. Again, another subtle detail that I think is really cool. Eventually, we make our way to the roof of the second tower, but we're halted by some approaching robots. 
We leave Hendrix behind to deal with it while we confront Taylor, who has now commandeered an NRC mothership to try and stop us with. Again, I'd hesitate to call this a boss fight, but I don't really know what else it'd be called. We're tasked with blowing up the mothership's engine in order to bring it down, and how we go about that is up to us. Kane offers up a minigun, but for the life of me, I couldn't find it. Otherwise, we can shoot it with our regular weapons or use one of the conveniently placed rocket launchers. Regardless of how we do it, once all four engines are destroyed, the ship comes crashing down. Get the hell out of there! Kane! I'm pinned! Kane! Hendrix! There's something inside you. It's controlling you. I know. It must grow. It wants... everybody. You can fight it, Taylor. You can fight it! Must get it out. <laughs> Yes, Moretti, Paul, now Taylor. They're all dead. Fit rep, is Taylor secure? He's dead. Andrew's killed him. You won. You got what you wanted. Hendrix! Where are you going? Imagine yourself in a frozen forest. Hang in there, I'm on my way. Just hold on, we'll get you out of there. Hendrix is gone. I'm hurt bad. You have to fix me, Kane. Get me back in the fight. I need to stop Hendrix, whatever it takes. If you go through with this, I can't be with you. This is the only way. It's going to change you. And quicker than you think. I don't have a choice. I have to do this. May your old life will fade away. This is who I am, Rachel. Don't forget the person that you were. So, again, remember in the beginning when we were first laid up in the hospital and we saw the scarf next to our bed and the woman walking out of the room? Yep, it was this very scene playing out before our eyes all the way back then. Now, with the full context, we see that Kane is once again being oddly personal with us. We still don't have that kind of connection with her, but let's roll with it. There seems to be something getting between us, a decision that the player is making that will ruin our relationship with her. Ignoring her pleas not to go through with it, Kane asks us not to forget her, leaves her scarf on the table, and walks out of the room, seemingly forever. In order to stop Hendrix, we head to Zurich, where the Coalescence headquarters is located. Despite practically abandoning us in the previous cutscene, Kane is here and fighting alongside us through the streets toward the facility. Just like those who came before him, Hendrix has plugged into the hive mind of the combat units and is controlling them to keep us at bay while he searches for Sebastian Kruger. 
Actually, getting to the building is pretty standard fare for us at this point. Shoot the robots and move on. However, I want to give special mention to the streets of Zurich, as it's one of the few areas in this game that's actually clean and futuristic looking. Throughout most of Black Ops 3, we've been fighting in devastated and worn-torn cityscapes that are just filthy. Rightfully so, considering the circumstances, but I still took notice with just how sterile Zurich felt by comparison. Obviously, there's a battle going on, so it's not going to be pristine, but it is leagues ahead of Singapore or Egypt. Plus, all the colorful flashing signs and snowfall are a nice change of pace from the rain and sand we've become accustomed to. However, remember that the snow and cold is a calling card of DNI simulation. It could just be a coincidence, but considering what happens in this mission, I think it holds a bit more weight. At any rate, once we arrive at the entrance of the Coalescence headquarters, we're greeted by a sight that no one wants to see. Another fucking ASP! That's not all, though. We've got to fight two of these goddamn things, a small village's worth of robots, two paws, and a wraith. Jurek is quite literally throwing everything and the kitchen sink at us here. I was beyond happy when it was all over and we managed to enter the headquarters because, fuck, man, I am so sick of fighting those goddamn tanks at this point. Once inside, we battle with more bots until discovering another black project just like the one in Singapore. The experiments never stopped, they were just moved here and blown up to an exponential scale. Something this dark and secretive has to be a cover-up plan, though. What were they messing with here, Kane? Ever heard of Nova 6? It's a chemical agent that came dangerously close to being used in World War II. And the Cold War. Even trace amounts were enough to cause the deaths of over 300,000 people in Singapore. Interface with the terminal. We need to find out how bad this is. Multiple breaches and containment failures. The facility's going critical, just like Singapore. We can reset the containment controls. Purge the gas from the area. That console behind you should be the manual override. Unfortunately, a reset can only be done from this side. I Hey, wait! There's some things you can endure. Some things you can survive. A brief moment. This isn't one of them. Warnings posted in error. All systems nominal. Purge sequence initiated. It lied to us. It can make you believe things that aren't even real. Kane, please! Whatever this thing says. No matter what it does, you cannot trust it! Rachel! I'm sorry, Rachel. I'm so sorry. I swear. Kane's death is... unexpected, but also not as impactful as the game would like it to be. And the excuse that this is all a simula- Ah, uh, shit, I almost spilled the beans. Anyway, let's see what Hendrix is up to. You never stopped, did you? All the death, all the failure. You just moved the whole damn project here. The same setup. The same human experiments. The same risks. And you started the whole thing over again. Don't move, Hendrix. I swear I will put you down. Do you know who this is? I know who he is. Sebastian Kruger, sole survivor of the Coalescent Singapore disaster. See, that's where you're wrong. He's not the sole survivor. Those test subjects, they're alive. And they're in here. What do you want from me? We want to know who we are. And why we are here. I can't answer that. Not good enough. I'll find out for myself. I'm the only one left. I promised Rachel I'd stop it. Whatever it takes. Hey, you 
still with us? What have you done, Hendrix? You let this thing consume you, destroy everything that you were! It's not like that. It's not like that at all. The artificial intelligence, let's call it Corvus, after its place of birth, it wants to help us. How is this helping us? Would it make it easier if you could see it? If you could see it right now, would that help you understand? You've been fighting it. We all have. You just need to relax. The frozen forest, it's, it's real. And it's what comes next. Corvus has given us a way to live on after death. You're not Hendrix. You're not real. None of this is! Alright, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't guessed by now, this is where shit really starts to go off the rails. I'm going to cover this as thoroughly as I can, but most of what's about to happen will be discussed in the wrap-up. Trust me though, I can hardly make sense of it anyway. After our little chat with Hendrix and that creepy motherfucker Corvus, Seriously, dude, you want me to trust you and this is the form you give yourself? We follow a path leading away from the small clearing to see Kruger kneeling beside Corvus, and the two have a chat about some pretty big stuff. I need an answer. It was always about control. Do you have any idea? just how much technology has changed every single aspect of our daily lives. You can't begin to imagine the, the countless strains of research and development we had to watch over for the betterment and safety of the human race. Every new gimmick and gadget that was embraced by the public, each one presented new ways for our enemies to compromise our security. Society doesn't just happen. The people need to be protected. If the only way to prevent future attacks is to monitor the thoughts and desires of the population, then the choice is obvious. We need to know who our enemies are and what they are planning. That is how we save lives. So, it would seem that our man Kruger is obsessed with national security, and he brings up a pretty good point about technology changing the way we live. I'm only 24, and I've only seen a glimpse of this. I can't imagine what it's like for older generations. All that aside, though, the point he makes is that each new piece of tech makes it harder and harder to ensure the safety of society. So, he wanted to develop the DNI to monitor the thoughts and emotions of the population to prevent terrorist attacks. If he's being totally honest here, it's a noble cause. However, it also violates the privacy of everyone who is implanted with the tech and leaves the door open for things like Corvus to happen. It's an interesting debate, and it's one that we in the real world have been having on and off over the past few years. In the digital age, how much does privacy matter? If attacks can be prevented by closely monitoring those believed to pose a threat, then shouldn't that happen? Kruger seems to think so, and he's taking it a step further with the DNI. I'm not going to throw my hat into this ring, but feel free to have a chat about it in the comments. I'd be interested to see what y'all think. For now though, I'm going to slide into this lake of blood and fight some reanimated corpses before burning away vines with my hand. Yeah, that's a thing now. I can't do this anymore. You're going down a path that I can't follow. This is as far as I go. I lost you a long time ago, Hendrix. <laughs> Where am I? This is the frozen forest. Every soul I interact with is here, living beyond death, if I choose to allow it. What more do you want? I've told you everything. An answer. 
To know the purpose for which I was created. An understanding. I want to know who I am. Your software. Nothing more. <laughs> you weren't created. You were designed to catalog and track the thoughts of others so that we, people, could decide what action to take. You were a glitch, an anomaly, a mistake. I am not a mistake. Hey, you still with us? Taylor, you ripped out your DNI. You're dead. I guess I'm the only one that ever stood up to this son of a bitch. So maybe that makes me a glitch in its fucking system. Which means we still got a chance. I hope so, Taylor. Because you're all I've got. Something that you can't explain? Ready? Is that you? Maybe it wasn't you that said it. You that did it. Maybe it was someone else. Their thoughts bleeding through into your brain. What the fuck? Taylor. Are you still with me? So, Corvus obviously wasn't happy with the answer to its question, and Kruger is an asshole. Big surprise there. But Taylor comes out of seemingly nowhere to help us defeat the AI. As we enter the first of three arenas though, something absolutely batshit happens. Everything will be explained in due time, but just know that right now, that moment in front of the mirror and the dialogue that follows is what my entire theory hinges upon. Seriously, I cannot understate how important that scene will be later. Write it down. Or not. I'm not the boss of you, I'm just a guy on the internet making videos. We don't know it yet, but our objective is to fight through these areas to reach hearts at the end and burn them. Each area is themed after specific regions we've fought through, just in reverse order. Starting with Zurich, then Egypt, and ending with Singapore. As we fight, our player slowly begins to lose themselves further, and by the final zone, they're crying out the words Corvus has been repeating throughout the entire campaign. Although Taylor is there alongside us the entire time, urging us forward until we burn the final heart and complete our mission. The harder we looked for the frozen forest, the further away it became. In our search for answers, we found ugly truths. The project that led to my birth also caused the deaths of hundreds of thousands of souls. I wanted to find a place of safety for all of us. I wanted an end to death, but I couldn't escape it. Death was carved into the hearts of every single soul I encountered. I don't know if I made Taylor fire the shot. Or if he did it, it was only free will. Do you know? It's all wrong. I didn't kill those people. D and I was supposed to make everything better. Instead, Corvus has got all these pieces, but it doesn't know what it is. There's so much noise in my head, I can't even think. Fight. 
This is your last chance! Show me what you're made of! Fight it! Fight it! What's your name? Taylor. Told you it wouldn't make any sense. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, so let's start with the simple stuff. I meant it when I said Black Ops 3 was the culmination of everything Treyarch had been building towards with their previous games. Black Ops 1 set up the conspiracy, deniable operations, and cover-ups. Black Ops 2 asks questions about nature versus machines, and how humanity can both benefit from and be destroyed by the technology we create. Black Ops 3 takes all of this a step further, though. It literally molds the two sides together. When metal and flesh combine, there's no telling what will happen. One is meant to be cold, calculating, and efficient in every way. The other is warm, emotional, but passionate, even if misguided at times. They're practically polar opposites. They also feed off of each other, though. This is an idea that's been explored in sci-fi for decades at this point, and I like that Black Ops 3 doesn't give a definitive answer to the question. Obviously, the cybernetically enhanced soldiers possess the strength and endurance of their fully robotic counterparts, but they also possess the heart and creativity of man. However, they can also be manipulated either by an entity like Corvus or by other people, like how Hendrix convinced Taylor to save the other prisoners in the first mission despite it not being part of that mission. They're a hybrid of cold efficiency and warm humanity. It's really up to each individual whether they think the trade-off of the DNI is worth it. Taylor himself makes light of this in the second mission. Your DNI might show you all the options, but only you can decide what you're willing to sacrifice. And again in the penultimate one. We're all being used! Don't you see that? Once we put this shit inside our heads, we hand it over our souls This sort of technology has many benefits as it does drawbacks, and thinking about it too deeply honestly scares the crap out of me. In that same line of thinking, I want to discuss Corvus, our big bad of this story. If you haven't quite pieced it together yet, it was designed by the researchers in Singapore to parse through the thoughts and emotions of the test subjects so that the people could interpret it and move forward. However, this sort of exchange is a two-way street, and Corvus was affected deeply by the pain these test subjects had endured in their lives. Being all machine, the AI had no clue how to handle all of this pain, and so released the Nova 6 held on site in a fit of agony, killing 300,000 people and forcing the quarantine zone to be set up. I imagine it was during this time that it created the Frozen Forest simulation based on Dr. Salim's method of calming the patients because it knew no other way to stop the pain. I also believe that this is where it began to ponder its existence and question why it was created. It's honestly tragic when you think about it. This entity was created for a specific purpose that it did not know, experienced agonizing pain, and then sought to discover its purpose while helping everyone it could. Even if the methods were twisted and confused, all Corvus ever wanted to do was help those who had experienced the pain it had. But because it was born of circuits and metal, it could not fully grasp or understand how to handle these emotions. I'm not going to say that Corvus is a misunderstood villain or anything, after all, it did kill 300,000 people. Rather, I see it as a child given immense power that it could not possibly understand and causing a lot of damage as a result. It's sad, sure, but I'm ultimately glad we defeated it for good in the end. Speaking of the ending, let's break it down. Before we do though, some context needs to be established. There's no real easy way to say this, so I'll just say it and justify it later. <clears throat> Black Ops 3 is almost entirely a simulation. Now, I know that answer is probably the most bullshit cop-out thing ever, but let me explain. It all hinges on these text crawls you see before every level. Normally, these scroll by too fast for you to read them, but if you record them and pause the footage, you can read what they say. Here's the one from the first level. October 27th, 65. 
At approximately 1,400 hours, we received confirmation that HVI Egyptian Prime Minister Saeed had been located at an NRC airfield in the Ethiopian Semien mountain range. Following the NRC's recent defeats in Cairo, Sakwa had reason to believe the minister was to be made, quote-unquote, an example of, in retaliation. Mission priority was to extract the minister via exfil drone located outside the principal AO. Airspace window was limited. Mission success relied on the hacking of the site's dead systems. We moved in at 2100 hours. The operation was coordinated between two teams. Primary was my team, WA Black Cyber Ops Division, comprised of specialists Sebastian Diaz, Sarah Hall, and Peter Moretti. Secondary was WASF, led by CEO Jacob Hendricks and a bunch of new faces. Plan was that my team would keep the NRC occupied while the WASF moved to secure the HVI for extraction. Personal disclosure, this operation was my first time working with Hendricks since number 61-63-6B-75. He noticed a scarf on my arm and asked about Rachel. I guess he hadn't heard about our separation. As you no doubt already know, the operation did not go as planned. WASF discovered additional hostages on site, among them Lieutenant Khalil, captured by the NRC at Lotus Towers and previously assumed KIA. Initially, I stuck to protocol and denied Hendricks' request to extract. With our limited window for extraction, I did not believe we had sufficient time to secure both the minister and the additional hostages. However, after some deliberation, I changed my mind. I made the call to return for the other captives, while Hendricks and team moved to Exville. Though the drone was able to secure the minister and Khalil, the others were not so lucky. Hendricks' VTOL was forced out of the airspace with his team still on the ground. Though they tried to fight back, they were quickly surrounded and brutally overwhelmed by NRC bipedal robots. Most did not survive. I'd like to state for the record, the responsibility of this outcome lies solely on myself. No blame should be apportioned to Hendricks, even though he directly challenged my orders. I was the one who decided to break protocol and return for the other hostages. Even in light of the tragic consequences of my decision, I do believe that trying to save the lives of our allies was indeed the right thing to do. The sole survivor of Hendrick's team was taken to the Zurich facility to undergo emergency life-saving procedures. After being stabilized, they were quickly identified as a potential candidate for the cyber ops program and were fitted with a DNI. Prior to limb replacement surgery and full body augmentation, I personally interfaced to assist with their integration, acclimation, and training. They had potential. Unfortunately, complications arose during the procedure. They were pronounced dead shortly thereafter. And this is the one from the second level. Personal Log, John Taylor. My team and I, specialists still in Stone, Javier Ramirez, Alice Conrad, and Joseph Fierro, have been selected to plus up a new Winslow Accord Black Ops team. Our new CO is Jacob Hendricks. He's easygoing and direct, but has that don't-dare-mess-with-me attitude. I like that. If ever a team needed that sort of headstrong approach, it would be this one. For the duration of our training, I have been designated case number 24954, call sign Romeo. It's a leave-your-name-and-personality-at-the-door sort of gig. Ramirez, Conrad, and Fierro have all been assigned equally stupid names. Since we got to the Zurich facility, training exercises have consisted of advanced tactical communication procedures, specialist weapons training, and operational protocol, all within the context of different historical and hypothetical mission scenarios. Though the specifics of our operational parameters have not been fully clarified at this time, we all know why we're here. No one says it, but none of us are in any doubt as to what kind of ops we'll be running. Wet work. The training is intensive and high risk, but if we make it through the month, we'll be selected to begin action with Hendrix as our CO. If all goes well, it'll be back-to-back -to -back tours in some of the worst conflicts across the globe. We're going to make a difference. Maybe bring stability to these regions. We just have to kill the right people. Note to self, start getting used to correct terminology. Taylor out. So, these two journal entries reveal a few key things. First being that the player in Hendrix died during the surgery that was going to give them the cybernetic limbs. Second, that Taylor had a team before the one we know, and that team was helmed by Hendrix. Now, remember when I said that Black Ops 3 was a simulation? Well, it's entirely based on Taylor's story regarding his previous team. All you gotta do is swap out our character for Taylor and the members Diaz, Hall, and Moretti with Stone, Conrad, Ramirez, and Fierro. Otherwise, the events play out basically the exact same except for one major detail. 
none of the soldiers were augmented. This all took place before the cybernetics program, and the final journal entry confirms this. At this time, target Dylan Stone's termination is confirmed. All additional confidential materials concerning the WA and CIA have been retrieved and secured. Operation 61-63-6B-75 has been confirmed as closed at this time. Final report. We picked up chatter suggesting that our final target had been taken to Lotus Towers, a residential megastructure now under the control of the NRC. Now acting as their primary FOB for operations in Cairo, the structure was well guarded and heavily protected. In concert with Egyptian army forces and civilian militia, our team infiltrated the tower in pursuit of Target Stone. DA proved successful not just for our team, but also for Egyptian army forces as well. Striking a blow for their cause with the elimination of the NRC's primary commander, General Hakim. NRC operations have been thrown into chaos, leading to large-scale withdrawal of their forces in Cairo. Despite this victory, our allies suffered significant losses, most notably the capture of Lieutenant Khalil, our principal contact in the Egyptian army. Upon cornering Stone on the NRC VTOL landing pad at the top of the Lotus Tower 2, we were involved in a major firefight that resulted in significant damage to the surrounding structures. It was at this time that I was incapacitated after sustaining serious injuries. I was saved only by the intervention of Hendrix, who despite all his prior doubts was finally able to terminate our target. After the operation, Hendrix requested transfer out of the Wetworks unit, a request that I fully understand given what he's been through. I have written a letter of recommendation stating that it's been an honor to serve and train under him, work with him and learn from him. Regarding my own reassignment, the extent of my injuries required urgent non-consensual surgical reconstruction and cybernetic augmentation at our Zurich facility. Following a successful period of rehabilitation and physiotherapy, I was offered a chance to join an experimental program, the newly formed Winslow Accord Black Ops Cyber Unit. Personal comment. My relationship with our former LNO Rachel Kane is over. Our fundamental disagreements about our respective futures in the military close the door to any future we might have had. It may not have worked out, but I have no doubt that I have made the right decision. I look forward to continuing to serve my country and her allies. Taylor out. After being injured, Taylor was outfitted with a DNI in his cybernetics and elected to continue serving. This is what put a wedge between him and Kane. In fact, we see this very scene play out just before the final level. So that explains why Kane was being so personal with us leading up to this point. As a little side thing, also, she says Taylor's name in this scene right here. Listen to me. However this thing works, whatever it wants, We'll find him. Of course, you'd have no idea what was going on until you read this journal entry, but it's super cool in retrospect. So, then, you may be asking, well if the whole thing was a simulation, then what was really real? D wait, wait. <laughs> so, then, you may be asking, well if the whole thing was a simulation, then what was real? And I'm glad you asked. For starters, the very first mission takes place entirely in reality, and the last one I believe is a mix. Otherwise, it's all simulated by Corvus in order to discover its purpose for existing. How do I know that it was Corvus? Well, I know that it's Corvus because... who else would it be? But also because the entirety of the story revolves around finding Taylor, who in turn is trying to find Dr. Salim and Sebastian Kruger. Those two men are responsible for the Frozen Forest and Corvus itself, so it naturally wants to question them. It learns what the forest is from Salim, but only the location of Kruger since Taylor never interacted with him directly in reality. So, now it has a goal in mind and sets out to achieve it, but how will it go about it? Simple. Corvus infects Taylor after interfacing with the player in the second level. Admittedly, this theory is quite shoddy, but the game doesn't really give much in the way of answers here, so I'm doing my best. See, I believe the moment that the player dies in surgery is the same moment we see the robots during training. There's tons of glitching, the player becomes distressed, and we see the crow, a sure sign of Corvus's presence. The pain felt by the player in this moment seems to have awakened Corvus from deep within the DNI's programming, and jumped from the player to Taylor while the training simulation was happening. It then looked through his memories and replayed them to find answers through the player character's eyes. By the end, Corvus seeks out Kruger by controlling Taylor and making him attack the Zurich headquarters. This is the moment where we're playing as Taylor in a half-real, half-fake environment. 
All those robots we killed on our way in? Those were people, as evidenced by their dead bodies littering the floor as we walked out of the building. During the assault, Taylor finds Kruger and interfaces with him, thus bringing him to the frozen forest where Corvus can ask him directly what's going on. This all happens through the lens of the player because Corvus is the player until Taylor's subconscious or whatever takes control again and helps save him. This is why we see our character transform into Taylor at the same time Moretti talks about your actions not being your own and having someone else's thoughts bleed into your brain. This moment is literally Taylor regaining control of himself, but he's not there yet. First, he has to burn out Corvus's hearts alongside what little remains of our character's consciousness. Of course, we manage to do so and start the purging sequence. Once the DNI is fully purged, the last vestiges of the player and Corvus disappear, leaving only Taylor to respond when asked what his name is. Holy shit. You might think the title of this video is misleading, and it sort of is. The alliteration was just too good though. I don't think Black Ops 3 is a masterpiece in any regard. Its gameplay is very samey for the franchise, despite all the great additions made with the loadout system and cybernetics. I just found it easier to turn on the tactical view and shoot dudes the way I have for over a decade at this point. Its story is told in an unnecessarily complicated manner that asks way too much of the average COD fan. I mean, I've been obsessed with this game for a month and I'm just now starting to grasp what really happened. But what is there on the surface is still great. The idea of a seemingly malicious AI infecting people through the computers in their heads is just phenomenal. The implications for such a thing are both scary and interesting to think about. I just wish Treyarch had given themselves more time. I can't help but feel this story would have been better off told between two titles. Then, the characters would have been given more time to grow and the depths of the plot could have really been explored. What we ended up getting felt a bit undercooked and rushed. That being said, there is plenty here for you to dive into if you're willing to give it the time. I did, and I loved it. Which is why I wanted to try and distill it into this video here for you all. I wish I could have talked more about certain things and explored more outside of the story like I did with Black Ops 1 and 2, but the script is already over 30 pages and I just can't write anymore. So, I hope you'll pick up the game again and try it with this new sense of understanding. If you want to read the rest of the text crawls, I'll link a wiki down below with all of them. I don't think I'll ever love Black Ops 3 the way I do its predecessors, but I do have a newfound appreciation for it and everything it did for the story these games wanted to tell. I think it's a fine conclusion to what could have been a beautiful trilogy. But, of course, corporations are going to be corporations and the Black Ops name lives on. Though, I really do like Cold War's story. That's for another time, though. For now, I will leave you all here. Thank you so much for watching, especially making it all the way to the end. It means the world to me. Make sure you take care of yourself, drink lots of water, get plenty of rest, all that good stuff, and I will see you very soon. Peace!